morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you. Where's our online live camera? There it is. I think that's online. Let's wave to everybody who's worshiping with us online. We're glad that you've joined us here this morning for worship through your phone or computer or TV or whatever. Isn't that crazy, the day we live in? If you'd time traveled 50 years ago, told somebody you could attend church through your phone. They would have thought you took crazy pills, so that's nuts. Well, uh, again, good morning, everybody. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Hey. Woo. Yeah, I love me some Mexican food. So Great. So happy Cinco de Mayo. We're glad that you're here this morning. Glad that you've joined us. Um, If you're new with us or maybe a guest of somebody, you know, especially after the Easter season, my name is Trevor. I'm one of the pastors here at Community of Hope. You just saw a video of our lead pastor, Pastor Dale, and uh, he uh, just gave a little brief introduction about long story short for us. Now, many of you know Dale has been recovering from his vocal cord procedure. Last week, you guys saw a video of Dale. Thank you for being patient with us and letting us experiment and to do some stuff to watch his pitch count. He's allowed to preach one time a week, and then we're going to bump it up to two, and then we'll get to three. So we're going to be experimenting. We're going to be trying. So y'all pray for wisdom for us and patience for y'all. Can you do that? Great. Okay. That was really warm. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that was about as warm as an ice cube. Great. So make sure you're doing that. We'll pray for Dale this week. Um, he's doing a really cool thing uh, this week. He, Dale, you might not know this, but Dale has one of the prestigious honors of he sits as a trustee on the board of trustees for Asbury Theological Seminary. That is a big deal. That means uh, Dale is up there on the board with people literally from all over the world guiding the seminary, which is like pastor's school for one of the most important seminaries in all of the world. And he's there this week doing that work uh, to guide that school, to send out pastors and leaders literally all over the globe for the sake of the message of Jesus. Would you pray for Dale this week? Great, great. Please keep doing that. Please keep praying for his recovery, which is going well. And we're going to get to bump up his pitch count each week. So now he's cleared to talk. Now we're slowly, gradually getting his voice strength there. So thanks for working with us on that. Well, it's great to be here again with you guys. I was at the East Campus last week. It's great to lead worship here with Keith. He and I are usually the team over at the East Campus. I call him the Puerto Rican powerhouse. How about that? Yep. And then I call myself the Scottish Sasquatch. So we make, we make a good team. So can we thank Keith and the team for leading us in worship? Can we thank them for that? It's great. Awesome stuff. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So as Dale said in the video uh, that we learned last week about the author of the story and how he made everything good, but we're going to learn this week about another character in the story. I want to talk to you this morning about villains. I want to talk to you about how in every compelling story, there's always a wicked, evil, nefarious villain in every great story. Now, I looked at stories, did some research on stories. What are the great villains in the history of literature and fiction? Um, and so a lot of times, if there's a, a great villain, a great story in a book or in literature, it somehow makes its way onto the big screen. So there's a lot of overlap there. Don't worry. I also read books, not just watch movies, okay? So here's some great villains that I, uh, that I in just my research, are trying to wrap my head around this idea this week that I thought of. So first, I think of the great Darth Vader, Mm. So I want, you, I want you to be with me if you, these are some of your favorite villains. So may the fourth be with you. Yesterday was Star Wars Day. The nerds in the room told me yesterday was May the 4th, so Star Wars Day. Today is Revenge of the 5th, right? And then for the real Star Wars nerds in the room, tomorrow is Return of the 6th. Did I get it right? I got it right. Very good. Um, and so maybe if you're not a Star Wars person, maybe you're this. Maybe your favorite villain is he who shall not be named, Lord Voldemort. Ooh, yeah, Voldemort. He's an evil, real evil villain. Uh, maybe they're not your, your, maybe they're not your batch of characters. Maybe you're more of a Batman person like myself. If I couldn't be a pastor, I'd want to be Batman one day when I grow up. And so maybe you like the Joker. The Joker, one of the great villains of all time. Why so serious? If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, especially if you've actually read the books, uh, one of your favorite villains is Sauron, the great, ooh, and the evil eye of Sauron. Um, I've been team teaching this week. Our assistant director of student ministry, Danny Franson, is preaching over at the East Campus, and she reminded me, Trevor, you need to have girl villains in here, too, from girl movies like Disney movies. So there's <laughs> Ursula from Little Mermaid. Okay, there's Ursula. There's Ursula from Little Mermaid. There's also Scar from Lion King, right? Great villains. The villain who's just red hot in culture right now is the mad titan himself, the purple man Thanos. Thanos and his snap that changed everything. How many of you seen Avengers Endgame? 
Have you seen it? Great. For the rest of us, I won't spoil the end game, but it's really good. Okay. And then there's another purple monster evil villain that we see. It's this one here. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I digress, I digress. But have you ever thought about, when we're thinking about all these villains, have you ever thought about why a story um, really speaks to us if there's a villain? Have you ever thought of that? Like, why is it for a story to be compelling to human beings, there has to be an evil, wicked villain in it? Why is that? Why does that make sense? Why does that click? Why is that the blueprint of every great story ever? Why does it make sense to you? Is it just because that's how literature works and it's like pieces of a puzzle? Or is it that there's something that's been hardwired in you that knows that evil is real and that villains are real and that there's a battle to be fought and a war to be waged and that evil must be faced? We're talking about that today. So last week, Pastor Dale, uh, Pastor Dale here at the West Campus and me over at the East Campus, we talked about how the story started good. In fact, that was the title of last week's message was good, how God created everything good. And through day one through six, God created everything in the universe and he made it good and not just good. He made it very, very good. And not only the things that he created were good, but there's all sorts of other things that we saw that were good. Relationships were good from the Trinity to Adam and Eve Purpose was good for what Adam and Eve were assigned to do in the garden. Order out of chaos was good. Rest was good. It was all good. It was so, so, so good. And we ended the, the message last week by talking about the why is it not good now? Why is it now the world we live in where marriages sometimes end in divorce? Why is it in the world we live in why children suffer abuse? or why worshipers are attacked by terrorists? Why is it in the world that we live in that friends betray us, our bodies deteriorate, and the people we love die? Why? Preacher, you said it started good. Are you a liar? Because it isn't good. Hmm. It's created good, but something happened to get us here. Now, if we're not careful with how we're talking about this idea, um, it's really easy to say, so it started good, and now here we are, so it's easy for people to point a finger, blame God. Tell me if you've ever heard anybody say this, in the face of bad news, everything happens for a reason. That's unknowingly passing the buck onto God. Seeing this bad thing that's happening, well, it must be his idea. It must be part of the plan. He's responsible for all of it, isn't he? And what I'm here today to tell you is that it's not God's plan that the world got this way. It's not his will. It's not his idea. It's not the design. Something happened to what was good to make it bad of why we're here today. You need to know what we're going to talk about today because if you don't understand this movement in the long story short, you're not going to understand God. You're going to misunderstand your life. And you're going to misunderstand the most powerful, compelling message in the whole world. You've got to know movement two. Movement one was creation. Movement two is called the fall. And this is what we're talking about here this morning. The fall. So if you're new with us, we're, talking, it's, we're taking six weeks to summarize the whole Bible. That's right. We're going to take this hanyak of a book. Uh, most people don't know that word. Sorry, it's a word we use from back home. It's a big book. Okay. We're going to take six weeks to talk about this big book. If you can learn six words, you're going to learn the whole Bible. That's right. Cliff notes for the Bible. There we go. Now, we're talking about the fall. So our theme passage for, long story short, comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1 the second half of verse 45, and it says this here. Let's read it out loud all together. We, found, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What we're trying to get at with that theme verse is to tell you this whole book from beginning to end 
is all about Jesus. Even if Jesus doesn't show up until the New Testament, all the rest, it is about him. He's the hero of the Bible, the main character of the Bible, the hope of the Bible. It's all about him. Now, for today, our passage comes from Genesis 3. If you haven't grabbed your sermon notes yet, I encourage you to do that now. And uh, what we're going to be looking at is the first nine verses of Genesis 3. I could read the whole chapter, but we're doing long story short, so only nine verses. So follow along with me. Here we go. It says this. This is immediately after the creation accounts. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say You must not eat from any tree in the garden. Well, the woman said to the serpent, "Um, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was for was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were open. And they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, possibly one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? Let's pray. So Lord, I simply pray this morning that by the power of Jesus' name, the power of the Holy Spirit, that you bring an awakening this morning to our reality of the world that we live in, how we got here, and even ourselves. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, open eyes, open hearts to see and to know what you say is true about us in the world. For we believe what you say, that the truth will set us free. It's in your name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Okay, so this is a difficult passage to talk about. Um, First, what's most difficult is we're talking about this serpent, this snake. So let's just pause just for a minute, just to be perfectly clear. I hate snakes. I hate them. Who's with me? Who hates snakes? Good company. Who has a snake as a pet in the room? We're judging you just a little bit, okay? (laughs) Okay. Just a little bit. I hate snakes. I've told all my friends, like, there's some people like, ha I hate these things. And then other people like, no, I hate them. If you try to prank me, we're not going to be friends anymore. I hate snakes. I'm one of those people. I hate, hate, hate snakes. I hate them. So I clearly hate the serpent in this passage. Now, what's weird about this is, first off, you're thinking of this serpent, And if you're new to the Bible, you might be thinking of, why is the snake talking? (laughs) Um, I don't remember that in my biology class. Fair question. You know, it's even a more difficult question than that. If God created everything good, why is there an evil snake in the garden? (coughs) Did God put it there? See, there's a lot of good logical questions that are happening here. So let's talk about the villain of the whole story. The villain is the serpent. Let's talk about this character. Now, I'm not going to come here and give you an apologetic for why snakes should talk. If you are focusing on do snakes talk or not, you're asking the completely wrong question of the passage. It's not trying to talk about that or debate that at all. What you need to pay attention isn't what is talking. You need to pay attention today to what is said by the serpent. If you do that, you'll grow in wisdom today. So let's talk about the villain. Who is the villain? Well, the villain is the serpent. Well, who is this being? Who is this snake? So again, a lot of what we're doing in this series is long story short, I am bring, giving you an abbreviated account of the truth and the worldview of the Christian scriptures. And so I'm going to skinny a lot of stuff up. 
who is the serpent? The last book of the Bible says this in Revelation 12, 9. It says, the great dragon was hurled down. Again, this is apocalyptic literature that's um, using these imageries to describe truth in the spiritual realm. So the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent uh, called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So Genesis 3 never names the snake, never names the serpent, the devil, or Satan, but Jewish um, theologians and and Christian theologians have for centuries and centuries and centuries, and even longer, millennia, understood this character represents the devil and is Satan. Now, you might be here today mean like, okay, you telling me that I've come to church today and the win is for me to believe in a dude with horns and a pitchfork and that's the win, especially for people who are skeptical here today. That's not necessarily the win, but I want you to just be open with me just for a few minutes about what this passage teaches us of if there is an evil force at work in our world and if it is at work and does exist, what does it look like and how does it move? Just stay open with me for a few moments, okay? So the villain in the story, the Bible calls the devil calls him Satan. Now, did God put an evil being in the garden? No, he did not. Again, long story short, the scriptures teach that the devil or Satan was originally a good angel. And his good name, does anybody know it? Lucifer. Lucifer was the name of an archangel who was good, who was good and held the glory of God. Well, somehow, scripture tells us through a smattering of verses that you could put together to paint the story got prideful in his heart and got envious of the glory of God, wanted it for himself and rebelled against God. See, even angels have a degree of free will. And this angel used his free will to rebel against a good and loving creator, omnipotent God, and somehow convince a third of all the other angels to rebel with him. And they became fallen and rebelled against God. And there's a war in the spiritual realm as the Christian scriptures teach against forces of evil and forces of good. The good news is, good outnumbers evil two to one. And the leader of the evil is called Satan, or called the devil. Again, long story short, that's who he is. Now, what is he bent on? What does this evil being, this evil force that's represented in Genesis, Genesis 3, what's his goal? What's his end game? What does he want? Well, it says Jesus later on teaches about this, Jesus sometimes calls him the thief. Jesus said this, John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. See, some people, they get a little squidgy on this idea of spiritual evil, but Jesus himself, like if you took many of the gospels, especially the gospel of Mark, if you took out Jesus's conflict with spiritual forces of evil, you would not have much left of the gospel of Mark. It's everywhere. Jesus clearly believed that this, this being was real and was at work in the world. And he says his objective is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, is that figurative for spiritual things? He's come to take spiritual things from people and come to spiritually kill and come to destroy? Yes. It's also literal. Literal. And you ever felt like you ever had somebody stolen from you in life who died too early? It's figurative, and it's literal. That's what Jesus thought. So that's his goal, but what's his strategy? What is this serpent, if that's his goal, to steal from God and to kill things that matter to God? Because if he can't kill God, if he can't hurt God, what's he gonna do? He's gonna hurt, he's gonna hit God where it hurts the most, and God loves his kids. He loves humanity because we're made in his image, so if Satan can't hurt God, he's gonna hurt us. And how does he do that? How, does he, how is he going to accomplish that? Jesus, again, speaks to this in John 8, 44, which is interesting because Jesus is talking here not to quote-unquote sinners. Jesus is talking to religious professionals like me. And this is how Jesus wins friends and influences people. You, religious people, belong to your father, the devil. Oh, gee, thanks a lot, Jesus. Okay. And you want to carry out your father's desires. Listen to this. He was a murderer from the beginning. Are we in the beginning of the story? He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
This is why if you've hung out in church culture and some places in different type of churches in America, if you ever hear anybody shout out, the devil's a liar. This is why. Because he is. So rewind to Genesis 3. Think with me about this. What, what the serpent said again. Not that it's a talking snake. What he said. What he said starts off like this. Did God really say you weren't supposed to do that? Did he really actually say that? And he confused Eve and implanted doubt in her heart about what God spoke and what God said, just like he does to you and to me. How many of you ever thought in your head, well, did God really mean that when he said not to do it in this book? I mean, that's for ancient people. He didn't mean it for me and for today, right? So he lies about what God says. And then he lies about the consequences of sin. Where he looked at Eve and said, well, God says, if I eat, or if I eat this, I'll die. And she, Eve was confused. She said, if I touch it, I'll die, which God never said. So she's confused already. And he goes, you're not going to die if you eat from it? He's lying about consequences. So you might not have ever been tempted to eat a piece of spiritual magical fruit from a tree. But how many of you have ever heard this voice in your ear that says, no one will ever know, and you'll get away with it? See, you have a serpent in your ear too. So he lies about what God says. He lies about consequences of sin. He lies about outcome of sin. He told Eve, oh, go ahead and go ahead and eat the fruit. It will be pleasurable to you. Oh, your eyes will be opened. You'll become like God. You'll, oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Just do it. This is what you're going to get. This is what you're going to get. This is what you're going to get. And he lies. And Eve does not end up like God. Eve ends up breaking her life in the whole world. Just like how this serpent, if he's real, tells us and lies to us about consequences. You know, if you drink that too much, you're not going to feel bad. It's going to make you feel good. And if you sleep with that person, you'll feel loved. And it's going to make the pain go away. Oh, and now if, if you gossip about this other person, don't worry. You'll be accepted by the people you're gossiping to. It's how you're going to win, friends. Oh, if you hold that grudge, it's going to feel so good because you'll punish the other person. Oh, if, if you flirt with that old fling of yours on Facebook, no one's ever going to know. And you're going to feel loved and accepted like somebody wants you. Oh, if you just look at this thing on your phone that you know you shouldn't, it's going to take away your stress. Lie. 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 He lied to her, and he still lies today, if he's real. And Adam and Eve bought the lie. They took the fruit. Learn to distrust what God's word says, that God doesn't have my best interest in mind, that the Bible isn't true, that what God says I should not do, that the boundaries that God creates are actually to rob me of fun, not actually to protect me, that I'm actually not gonna die if I eat this, I'm actually gonna get things I want. And they took a bite out of the fruit, and she handed it to Adam, and he took a bite out of the fruit, and everything changed. See, what's funny is I guarantee you half of this room and half the people streaming online carry around a symbol of this story in their pockets. This one. <laughs> now, I'm not here to hate on Apple. I'm an Apple fanboy. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have a MacBook. I love the stuff. When they designed it, they were not trying to say they're pro-Satan. and they were, They're not doing any of that. That's, that's not the story of how they designed the logo, but it's ironic, isn't it? Because that symbol to the world means progress and technological knowledge and advancement. But that symbol, according to the Bible, means tragedy. See, every great story has a villain. And every great story has tragedy in it. The classical understanding of tragedy is when a story moves from prosperity 
to calamity, when things are good and they become very bad. And what's interesting about tragedy is that it's often because the main character makes a self-destructive decision that ruins everything. And that's why Genesis 3 is classic tragedy. See, there are many people, I mean, you've read tragedy your whole life. Shakespeare made a whole career off of writing tragedy, uh, tragedy and tragic stories like Anthony and Cleopatra, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, prosperity to calamity because of the decisions of the main characters. And that's what's happening here in Adam and Eve. They, they turned the story of the Bible, which was paradise, into tragedy because they chose to break God's command and did what's called sin. And sin is more than breaking a rule. Sin is anything that harms your relationship with God, anything that breaks your relationship with other people and with yourself and with God's good creation. What severs and breaks relationships is sin. And it's represented by rules in the Bible because God's trying to protect us. The great apologist, Ravi Zechariah, said this about sin. He said... Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is tragic, not just for Adam and Eve, but for our lives too, because of all the destruction and the horrible consequences it brings. If you go to read on later in Genesis 3, which you can on your own later, what happens with the consequences of sin is first off, there's curses instead of blessing. It's like the Garden of Eden, which is paradise, is literally flipped upside down and everything is ruined. Eve was supposed to be the mother of all human life and now she's cursed with pain and childbirth. So the Eve and all of her daughters that would follow after her, my goodness, until the industrial age, do you know how many women died in childbirth? What a horrible curse that when you're supposed to be bringing forth life, it causes death to the mother. And not only that, Eve also had a curse where she and Adam in Genesis 2 were equals equals, equals, and because of the curse, Eve becomes subjugated under Adam and desires it. So if you, women, if you have ever been brokenhearted or mad or frustrated about the treatment of women and the abuse of men towards women in all of human history and in our culture today, here's why it is. It's a result of the fall in sin. God did not make it that way. And then Adam, Adam was supposed to work the garden and take care of the garden. Work was good. Work is not a curse. It was good that everything Adam touched turned to gold and was fruitful and multiplied. And now he's cursed with toil, that the work he puts his hands to is painful, is hard, is gruesome. It sometimes is fruitful and sometimes is not. Any men in here tired of going to work? It's because of the fall. So there's not only curses, but the worst curse of all is death. Is death. It says in Genesis 3, 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are to dust you will return. Adam and Eve both died. But what's interesting in the book of Genesis is every generation after them lived shorter than them. Generation after generation after generation after generation, and their lifespan began to narrow. Like, death was inserted into the DNA of humanity to where now we read this in the New Testament. It says, therefore, in Romans 5, in 5, Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Death is horrible. Any of you ever felt like death is unfair? That it shouldn't be this way? It's because it's not supposed to be that way. Death was not part of the plan. And not only is there physical death, but worse of all, worse than curses, worse than death is spiritual death where Adam and Eve have now severed their relationship with God. It's broken. They're cast out from the Garden of Eden. 
And then every generation after them is not only living shorter, but every generation after them sins too. It's like something else got inserted into the DNA of the human heart, a proclivity to sin and to destruction. My goodness, Adam and Eve's two sons, Cain and Abel, one of them killed the other. There was only four people on earth then. And there's horror story after horror story after horror story until you get to Genesis 6, verse 5. It says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. It's like a spiritual disease called sin came into the human heart in this time and has affected every single person thereafter, including me and including you. This is what theologians call original sin. Where what's passed down to me and to you is not the moral guilt of somebody eating an apple, but what you inherited and what I inherited from our parents and their parents and their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. What we inherited is a corrupted spiritual nature that was originally made in the image of God and like a shattered mirror. We're broken. That's why this is called the fall. Because it's not just the fall of Adam and Eve. It's the fall of the human race. It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we've all fallen short hate to tell this to you, but you're a sinner, and I'm a sinner, and my wife is a sinner, a little bit bigger than me. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's a preacher joke. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I'm, yeah, but I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm fallen, and so are you. Don't believe the myth that people, the human, the human race is progressing. Don't believe the myth. It's a lie. So in the 20th century, sure, we had the proliferation of automobiles and airplanes and then technology like radio and television and telephones and then cell phones and then the internet, all oh, the medical advancements that we have in the world. We're progressing. We're progressing. It's getting better. In the 20th century, we had two world wars. The rise of Nazi Germany the rise of communism, the rise of terrorism, the collapse of Western morality, and the loss of the concept of is there anything true at all or not. It was the bloodiest century in all of human history. We are not progressing. It's because we're fallen. And you are fallen and I am fallen. And this is why the way the world is the way it is. God didn't make it this way. There was a villain who schemed and conspired that caused a tragedy that was made by free will and is perpetuated by free will every day by me and you. It's tragic. Now, what preacher would I be if we just said, amen, go home depressed? Because in every good story, there's a villain. And in every good story, there's a tragedy. And in the best stories, there's hope because there's a hero. And you might not have caught it if you've ever read Genesis 3, but there's a hero that's introduced in the midst of all this calamity and all this tragedy. Genesis 3.15, when God is speaking to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It doesn't say it there. But if you look with spiritual eyes, you'll read the name Jesus. This is the first time God promised about a coming one who will somehow be wounded by what the serpent would do. But yet in his wounding, he would crush the serpent. See, there's a day coming when God, instead of throwing away all of humanity, instead of God starting all over again or God abandoning all of humanity, God chose rescue. God chose redemption. God chose healing and forgiveness and reclamation. Or, yeah, that word. <laughs> we said there's a day coming 
when there is a man who will come who will crush Satan, who will crush sin, who will crush death, and he's coming. And he's coming. And it's a promise. And we see all the way towards the end of the Bible in Romans 16, 20, when it says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet and the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. There's promise, it's coming. There's a villain, there's tragedy, and there's a hero. Now come back next week because Pastor Dale and I are going to try to summarize the whole Old Testament in one week. <laughs> Pray for us, it's gonna be interesting. But you gotta know movement too. The rest of the world doesn't make sense unless you knew how it fell. And the rescue won't mean anything to you until you know why it needs to be rescued. Amen? Amen. So that's why it's appropriate for us to take communion here today. Because this is how God chose to deal with sin, how God chose to deal with the fall through the death and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. So before we take communion, the scriptures tell us that we need to take our time to confess our sins. So I invite you to bow your heads and not just Adam and Eve's, but confess your sins to a loving and merciful, holy God. Take time to pray, just you now. Confess your sins. scriptures tell us that while we were still sinners, while we still had the fruit in our hands, that's when Jesus chose to die for us. And friends, I want everyone to lift up your heads and look at me now. Because Jesus died for you while you were still a sinner, still a sinner, it proves that he loves you. He's crazy about you. He's wild about you. And he's proven it by the cross. So therefore, in the name of Jesus, you and I, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat to do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup, he gave thanks for it, and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Here it is for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink and do so in remembrance of me. So Father, we thank you for everything you've ever done, but the greatest thing ever was how you sent the hero to save us from Satan and sin and death. We thank you for Jesus. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this bread and on this juice and make it be for us the body and blood of Christ. And pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here that we may become the body of Christ for a fallen world in need of a hero. Come Holy Spirit, amen. In just a moment when I dismiss you, you'll stand up, you'll go at your left, my right, you'll go to each respective communion station. Somebody will tear off a piece of bread, they'll hand it to you. You'll dip the lower third in a cup and you take communion that way. We have a gluten-free station here at the back for anybody who has a gluten sensitivity. We always say community of hope. We have an open table, which means anybody can take communion in our church. But there's just one requirement, that you want to follow the hero. You want to follow Jesus. And if that's you, and if you want to live at peace with one another, come to the table. So friends, let's take communion. So friends, come back next week. You've heard about the fall, but there's more to the story. And what God begins to do right there in the garden is choose to rescue choose to redeem, choose to restore, and you'll see his first step next week. But until then, would you prepare your hearts to receive this benediction? Now may the God of peace soon crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And all God's people said, amen. Go in God's peace. We'll see you next weekend.